Hello, this will be a summary of uh, lab 8 in the microcontroller course and the task was to combine a few things from lab 5 and the first half of lab 8. So let's have a look first at what this was all about and uh, I have it connected here on the breadboard we see that the LCD here is connected, which is always a good idea if we want to use it for debug information, for example, to see what's happening inside our system. We have the potentiometer here connected in the same way as it was connected in lab 5 to one of the ADC inputs. It's now ADC 3 instead of ADC uh, 0. So we have a potentiometer which is connected to ADC3 and as it was connected before it's connected between plus 5 volts and 0 volts and with the wiper we thus can get any value, any voltage value between these two extremes by turning the axis of the potentiometer. Then additionally now we have the servo motor connected to PB1 and the servo motor needs pulses of different lengths in order to set its position. So we are supposed to be sending pulses which are of different lengths and each of these different lengths will correspond to a different position of the motor axis and 1.5 milliseconds or 1500 microseconds is usually the center position as it is positioned right now while the maximum is found around 2 milliseconds and the minimum position or the other extreme is found at pulse lengths of 1 millisecond. This is something which the motor does by itself so we only send these pulses of different lengths and the motor knows where it's supposed to be going. But we also have to repeat this information, so the update of these pulses should be about uh, every 20 milliseconds. So we are sending out one pulse and then the next pulse should, should come about 20 milliseconds after the first pulse was sent to the motor like on this sketch here. So this is how this motor is in principle working and the idea was now to let the microcontroller generate these pulses by utilizing the PWM function of a timer. And because these pulses here they look like PWM pulses don't they? Pulse width modulation, we have different pulse lengths and we are sending out pulses at regular intervals. So if you just analyze these pulses first a bit more, then this means that we want to send out a pulse in this scheme here. And let's say we aim for 1.5 milliseconds for a neutral position of the wiper of the motor and then doing this again after 20 milliseconds. So in terms of PWM modulation this would mean that our timer has to count up to a certain threshold value within 20 milliseconds 
and then start over counting for the next sequence. So this is our timer counter value, which should count to a top value here starting at zero. And then when it reaches a certain compare value, we want to actually have this affecting the pulse. So this would be our output compare value. This mode of the timer generating a pulse which starts at zero and ends when the uh, threshold value, the op compare value is reached is the normal mode, the non-inverting mode. We will see this in a second in the data sheet. But what we now have to find is a way for a counter to count for 20 milliseconds before it restarts. And then we have to find out how far or how high the compare value should be in relation to this complete value here. So our FCPU, our CPU clock frequency in our system is one megahertz. This means one clock cycle equals one microseconds. So 20 milliseconds equal 20,000 microseconds and 1.5 milliseconds would equal 1,500 microseconds. So what choices do we have now in an 80 mega? In an 80 mega we have three timers. We have timer zero, which is an 8-bit timer, which means it can count from 0 to 255. And we know that we have prescalers, which would allow the clock frequency to be scaled down. So even if it just can count from 0 to 255, there might be a way to let it count for 20,000 microseconds or 20 milliseconds. Timer one, on the other hand, is a 16-bit timer. So it can count from 0 to 65,535. And well, counting up to two th of 20,000 uh, would actually be within these, the possibilities of this timer here. And we have timer 2, which we have used in lab 7. And that is, again, an 8-bit timer. So 0 to 255. So let's have a look at timer one. We take the data sheet and we show you the data sheet like this. So if we go to the 16-bit timer counter one in the data sheet here, and we have a long chapter describing everything what this timer can do and how it's built up. Very interesting to read, too much to show now in detail for this video. Um, but I would say not too much to read through. And let's have a look. We are getting here. We are having the CTC modes clear on timer compare, where obviously our timer is counting to different top values before restarting. And there we can actually read that uh, it has something to do with the value in the OCR1A or the ICR1 register. So the counter value increases until a compare match occurs with either OCR1A or ICR1, and then the counter is cleared, restarting from zero. So this is what a CTC mode is. Then we have fast PWM modes. And 
what we are looking for is actually shown in the middle of the diagram here. It shows that normally the counter would count to its maximum value, to the top value. Um, there are different top values available here as well, fixed top values, but at maximum it would be 65,535 for a 16-bit timer. But there are some modes where actually the timer is counting to a different top value. And it says here in fast PWM mode, the counter is incremented until the counter value matches either one of the fixed values, 0x0ff, which is 255, 1ff, which is 511, or 3ff, which is 1023. So this would be 8, 9, and 10 bits of counting. And it says here that these are modes 5, 6, and 7 in the WGM uh, bits. It can also count to the value in ICR1, mode 14, or the value in OCR1A, mode 15. The counter is then cleared at the following timer clock cycle, the, the timing diagram, and so on. So. In these modes, we have the compare value, which is the horizontal dash here, which, which ends the pulse, starting at zero in the non-inverting mode here. And in these modes, it actually does not count up all the way. So let's have a look at the register setting, the corresponding register settings. And they are found up here in 16.11 where we have the register TCCR1A and TCCR1B, which are the timer, counter, one, control, registers A and B. And as we have seen from the table, we have the selection modes or, or selection bits for the mode in which our timer is running here, which is WGM1110, 1, 3, and 1, 2. And here we have the corresponding table which describes what all the 16 combinations of these four bits do. We have normal counting, which we have utilized in an earlier lab, where it would count to 65,535 uh, as the top value. Then we have PWM modes, phase correct and fast for 8, 9, and 10 bits, counting not to 65,000, but to 255, 511, 1023. And then we have the modes 14 and 15, which are also fast PWM modes, so that's what we want, that's what we need in order to generate the typical pulses for our servo motor. And it says here that they can count to the value stored in ICR1 or OCR1A as the top value. Our motor, our servo motor, which needs these pulse, uh, PWM pulses, is actually connected to PB1, we said. So if we look at the connection diagram of our microcontroller, we see that PB1 is actually OC1A. So OC1A is actually the PWM pin controlled by the compare register OCR1A in the timer one. So we cannot use this register at the same time as our top value. So therefore we need to choose timer mode 14. Timer one, mode 14, which is a fast, PWM mode counting from zero to top where top is the value stored in the register ICR1. 
So this again is one of our C code variables, which we can just simply assign a value to in our C code. And that will then tell the timer the top value up to which value it should count. So going back to this picture here, we now want it to count to this top value and we want it to reach this top value after 20,000 microseconds. Top should be reached. After 20,000 microseconds. But this is the same as saying that it's 20,000 CPU clock cycles. And we can use the CPU clock cycles as the input source for our timer. So we would then load up ICR1 with 20,000. Or in order to be absolutely accurate, we would make it 19,999 um, because our timer starts counting at zero. But this is a negligible difference between these two values on, on our system here. Then we would make sure that we use a no prescaler, which means that we are counting. one microsecond pulses from the CPU clock. And we want a non-inverting PDWM output on PB1 OC1A. So let's see if we can find the corresponding settings. And we start by the uh, output compare match pins here. So the bits, the first, the highest two bits in TCC R1A control the OC1A pin, as it says here in the text. So, and we are in a fast PWM mode. So we need to look at this table here. And we see that we have a non-inverting mode and an inverting mode. In the non-inverting mode, the, the pin is cleared, set to zero at compare match and set to uh, one or set simply at bottom of the counting. So looking back into our sketch here, this was exactly what we wanted. Uh, we want it to start when the counter starts at zero. So it should be set here when the counter starts counting at zero. And as soon as we reach our compare match, we want to clear the bit so that we go back to zero. So the combination which we need here is uh, one zero for these two bits. TCCR1A. We have the eight bits. And these two bits here, those are the COM1A1 and A0 bits. And we want to make it a 1 and a 0 non-inverting fast PWM. So this is bit 7, 6, 5, 4. 3, 2, 1, and 0. So what else do we need to set for our timer? We have to choose mode 14. We want mode 14 because it was counting to, to the top value stored in ICR1. So we need put it here. 
WGM one three one two one one and one zero should be as shown in the table one 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 zero one 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 zero so I noted it down on our sheet of paper here and now we have to find where these are located in our uh, registers and there we can see that we have WGM11 and 10 as the lowest two bits in TCCR1A. So these two bits here are these two bits. This is VGM11 and 1. Zero, and we want to have a one here and a zero there. The rest of the bits are not so interesting for us. These two bits are reserved, so they, they don't have any meaning for us. And for the B channel of uh, B, B WM channel of timer one, we just don't want to use it. And therefore we choose zero zero normal port operation um, pins disconnected. So we choose for these two, which are COM one B one and zero, we choose zero zero. So in the end we would end up with having one zero 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 one zero. in the 8 bits of TCCR 1A. So how about TCCR 1B? TCCR 1B is the second control register. There we will find that we have the other two WGM bits here. So we need to make sure that we are setting these correctly. Again, we have an 8-bit register, uh, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. And this, these two bits here are the WGM13 and 12 bits. So these are our bits coming from here, which means we need to set both of these to 1. And down here we have the clock prescaler. One, two, one, one, and one, zero. Let me show you. Here, CS1211 one, 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 and 10. One, these are the clock select pins and we have used these a couple of times before. So here we have the prescaler modes. Our microcontroller is running at one megahertz. So actually uh, the first one here will give us a full megahertz on the timer. This one would give us 125 kilohertz and uh, half of that is 60 something kilohertz and uh, or actually no one eighth I mean yeah whatever it's getting slower and slower here but we want to have this here we want to run the timer at one megahertz so therefore we are choosing 001 for these three bits which gives us a one to one prescaler counting at one megahertz and then we have the upper three bits what about the upper three bits in this register um, actually we can ignore them uh, input capture noise canceller 
and the input capture edge select. We are not using these features and this one here is a reserved bit. So these are now the values which we need to set into TCCR1A and TCCR1B. We already uh, said that we have to set our ICR register, our top value, to 20,000. And now we also need to set the output compare register 1A to a reasonable value for our pulses. And so 1,500 microseconds, 1 1.5 milliseconds, would be the neutral position. And in general, we could say that we want to have values roughly between 1,000 and 2000 here in order to match how these servo motors are working. The particular servo motor which I have here it rather needs values between 500 and 2500. So while this here is typical, your individual servo motors might actually have different values for the extreme positions. Um, the small ones which you buy nowadays, they normally have a, a wider span in these values than they used to have in the past, but they are still in the order of one millisecond and two milliseconds here, and the neutral position is still found at 1.5 milliseconds. So that was it about the timer settings in order to generate PWM pulses in the corresponding lengths. All we need to do is put a corresponding value into the OCR1A register and we will get automatically hardware generated PWM pulses of a corresponding length between 1.5 or around 1.5 milliseconds from our timer one once it's running. So now we have to look at the ADC. And for the ADC, we remember that's a 10-bit ADC, which means that it gives us values between 0 and 1023, depending on the actual voltage which we get into the analog to digital pin. But we'll have to actually initialize it. You have done that in lab five. Um, but let, let, let us look up the corresponding settings here from the data sheet. It's in the current version of the data sheet, chapter 24. And we go directly to the register descriptions. So here we have a register which is called Atmux which actually is the ADC multiplexer selection register. Here we are selecting the reference voltage to be used in the upper two bits. We are choosing whether we want to have the normal 10-bit representation of our numbers or the left-aligned odd representation, which we will not choose. And we have four bits actually determining which channel of the analog to digital converter we are supposed to be reading. And if we scroll back up to the beginning of the data sheet, then actually we can have a look at our pin out again. Uh, long index here. And in this pin out, As I said, we are connected to this pin here, to pin number 26 on the package, which is PC3 or ADC3. So ADC3 means that we have to choose uh, these, this bit combination here. So let me first write down this. So ADC3 means that max 3 to 0 should be 0011. 
I just noted it quickly here on my piece of paper. This is the corresponding row from our table. And now we want to have a look at the reference voltage. Our potentiometer was connected in a way that we get between 0 and 5 volts into the analog input. And that means that we have to use the 5 volt reference voltage AVCC here as our reference voltage for the analog to digital converter. So refs 1 and refs 0 Refs 1 should be set to a 0 and refs 0 should be set to a 1 in order to select the 5 volt reference voltage. Then we look what else we have for the analog to digital converter and we have a second register here which is the control and status register A. And here we have to take care about the highest bits ADC enable and start conversion as well about the prescaler bits down here which determine how fast our microcontrollers ADC is running. And here we have the corresponding table. And the background was that the analog to digital converter wants an input frequency between 100 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz. So from one megahertz, one hundred kilohertz to two hundred kilohertz clock rate from one megahertz CPU frequency. Wh what devices could we use? Well, one megahertz divided by eight is 125 kilohertz, which fits nicely into the range between 100 and 200. And let's have a look. We have the division by eight, which is this row here, which is ADPS2 is a zero. PS1 is a 1 and PS0 is a 1. So ADPS X should be 0, 1, 1 um, according to what we found in the table. So we have that and we have to make sure to Start the to enable the converter by setting a 1 into Arden and to start the conversion by actually once in, in a while setting a 1 bit here and then there was this side note text here again so ADSC AD start conversion in single conversion mode write this bit to 1 to start each conversion in free running mode, write this bit to 1 to start the first conversion. So this is not valid for us. Um, we are not in free running mode. The first conversion after ADSC has been written after the ADC has been enabled, or if ADSC is written at the same time, will take 25 ADC clock cycles instead of normal 13. We don't care about this. Um, but ADSC will read as one as long as a conversion is in progress. So meaning that as long as our ADC is still busy, when we read the value of the variable ADC SRA, then this bit will be a one. When the conversion is complete, it returns to zero. So when this, when we see that this bit has been turned to a zero by the microcontroller, then we know that our conversion is finished and then we can read the value. So with all these pieces together now, 
we should be able to put together some code here. And actually the code is already here. Um, so let's have a look through the code which I've put up here in uh, Microchip Studio. Um, we have our general header here where we tell the compiler that our CPU is running at one megahertz. We include the io.h library for the microcontroller so that our compiler knows what uh, all these registers are named and where they are located inside the chip. We include stdio, standard IO, in order to be able to use sprintf, which I'm using for debugging on the display. We include our usual delay.h library, util delay.h, so that we have delay microseconds and delay milliseconds in order to um, slow down our main loop a bit. We don't have to go at full speed through it. And we are including the external library lcd.h uh, by Peter Flurry, which we use to control our character lcd, which is connected here. And by now it has put up uh, some weird characters or the correct characters, but at the wrong location again. Uh, as you know, this happens from time to time. Um, I really don't care too much, but of course sometimes it would be nice to have a display which always looks correct. So looking at my init here, I put everything which is initializing the hardware into the function void init. Well, I could put a void here as well for cosmetic reasons, telling the compiler that this parenthesis is empty for a reason. Then we start by initializing the LCD display using a clear screen on the LCD display and go to 00, zero and write out the headline here, the title of the project Servo Control on the top row of the display. We need to define the pin where our servo motor is connected and where we are outputting the PWM pulses as an output pin. Even though it's not a general purpose I/O pin anymore, when we use it under PWM mode, we still have to um, set the corresponding value in the DDR register so that that our pin becomes an output pin. Well, there it is. So if we look here again, um, it's this pin down here, which we are talking about. So it is the OC1A pin, which is pin one in register B, output register B. So DDRB, this would be bit zero, this is bit one. Here we put a one, so now it's an output. The outputs for the LCD connections is fixed by itself in the background in the library. We don't have to take care about this. Then we have the register atmux, which was the, the second to large last register which we looked into right now. And we found out here on the paper that we want to set the max bits to represent the number 0011 in order to read from any block channel 3. And refs 1 should be 0, refs 0 should be 1. So this is exactly what I've done here. Refs, zero, refs 1 is shifting in a 0 to its position, refs 0 is shifting in a 1 to its position. And here we have 0, 0, 1, 1 for the max bits. We don't care about the Atla bit. It's set to 0 because we want to have right aligned output of our binary numbers. The last register which we were looking at is actually missing something here, I would say. So this code is not complete. Um, because it's lacking the setting of the clock prescaler. 
We said that we wanted to enable the analog to digital converter and that we are doing by shifting a one into the bit Arden. And then we start the first conversion here by actually also writing a one into the ADS-C bit already. Because the first, the first conversion takes longer time because it's also an initialization of the analog to digital converter and we want to actually well, we can start it right now so that it will be already running while we are doing the rest of the initializations. But we also said that we want to have the prescalers set accordingly. And there we said we wanted to have um, a one, a zero, one, one into the corresponding bits. Uh, let me just scroll back here. So that was actually what we saw here, the ADPS2, ADPS1, ADPS0. We wanted to select a clock prescaler of 8, which is this row here. So let's do it together here. Um, a 0 into ADPS2. The 2 is missing. So a 1 shifted into position ADPS1 and another one shifted into ADPS0. So now we are initializing uh, the ADC to run at 125 kilohertz. Reading from channel 3 with a reference voltage of 5 volts. Now we go to our timer and there we found out that we want to run up to the value which is stored in ICR1 and we write 19,999 or 20,000 into this register. We want to start at a neutral position which means that we want to output uh, 1500 microsecond long pulses. Um, from with 20,000 microsecond or at 20,000 uh, microsecond intervals. And then we set the rest which we found out which is a 1-0 combination in the COM1A1 and A0 bits selecting the non-inverting operation. Um, this one is disconnected, so channel B disconnected. And then we have the four bits determining the mode of our timer. And we select mode 14, which is 1110. Uh, which we see here, the third bit is a 1, the second bit is a 1, the first bit is a 1, and the zero bit is a 0. And we choose the 1 to 1 prescaler so that our timer runs at the full CPU clock frequency. So this is everything which is done in the init here. And then we have our main. So what's happening in main? First I reserve some memory, 40 characters, 40 bytes in memory for text to be output on the display. Then I go into my own initialize function here in it. And then we have our main loop here, which never ends while one. And here we start an analog to digital conversion. Remember that the first one which we started at the, in the init is probably still running when we get to this point here. But we then will um, later on start a new conversion every time we go through this loop here. We then wait until the conversion is finished. And how do we do this? While this bit here, the ADS-C bit, in an 
and combination with our ADC SRR gives us something which is logically true, we are executing what's in this bracket here. And there's nothing in this bracket, but we repeat this nothingness until, for whatever reason, this expression here should become false. And it becomes false immediately when the corresponding bit in the ADC SRR register is set to zero by our microcontroller. Then our code will detect, oh, now it's zero. This here, this statement is not no longer true. And thus we jump into our next row after the bracket here. And here we are taking the ADC value and I do a slightly different conversion now than I, what I was recommending for you in the instructions to start with. Um, so, as I said, in normal cases, we want to have a value between 1000 and 2000 microseconds for our pulse lengths. And our ADC gives us a value between 0 and 1000. So, what can we do? Well, we would just add... would just add 1000 to this value. So our OCR, 1A, needs about 1000 to about 2000 as a value. Our ADC register gives us between 0 and 1023. So ADC plus 1000 is in the range between 0 and 1023 plus 1000. So, yeah, it will start at 1000 and goes to 2023. That's what I wanted to say here. So we get a value which actually fits um, roughly. We are, we are making a 2 or 1% error here, but uh, yeah, no, we, we are not making any error as you saw and will see. So my servo seems to need between 500 and 2500 um, microsecond long pulses. So what I do here is that I take 500 plus 2 times ADC, which maps into the range 500 to 2, 2 times 1023 is 2026, so it's 2526, which is the highest value which we can get. So, of course, one could use floating point arithmetic here as well if you want to. In the Arduino, there is a function which is called map, which does exactly this. You, you give the two intervals, the input and the output interval, and it will do the mapping accordingly. But it's so simple arithmetics here that, yeah, this, this is good enough for us. And then I'm printing out the ADC and the OCR value on the LCD so that we actually can see what these values are. And I go to 01, which is the first character in the second row, print it out, and then we are returning up here. There's a 50 millisecond delay here, which seems to be a still a slightly bit too short to guarantee that the LCD can follow all the time but it almost works. Probably it should be a bit longer. However, our code, our microcontroller, our hardware only generates one pulse every 20 milliseconds. So during this wait time, there's only two more pulses generated anyway. So it doesn't really affect the accuracy or the behavior of our control system at all. So let's have a final look at the project here. Um, the potentiometer is about in the middle position. As we see, the ADC is reading back 516. The middle would be 511, 512. 
and the output value to the servo motor, the pulse length there is 1532, which means that it currently gets 1532 microsecond long pulses or 1.53 milliseconds. If I turn the potentiometer to the left side here, you see that the arm of the servo is turning to the right side. That can be adjusted by just turning around the um, potentiometer, no problem there. Um, now the ADC reads back zero because it's connected to zero volt on the input now. And the OCR register gets a value of 500, which sends 500 microsecond long pulses to the servo motor. The other extreme on the other side we have here. And here you can see that I made a mistake in my calculation here because 23 times 2 is of course 46 and not 26. So 2546 is the longest pulses which are sent to the motor, which makes the servo motor turn all the way to the left here and to all the way to the right correspondingly on the other side. So that was it about lab 8 and that's the final lab of the course. Um, thank you for this part of the course so far and see you again for the exam or for the project part depending on whether you're in the 5 or 10 credit course.